Okay, very good. So I guess, uh, yeah, I guess we can get started again. Yeah, so sorry I missed class on Tuesday. There's some issue with my traveling. So, but so today, so in order to recover, so today I'll teach for two hours and also next Thursday for two hours. Of course, if you have to leave, it's, it's totally fine. There are always recordings, which are actually a very nice quality. So I'll send you again the link. But I mean, I think you should have access to the link from the LMS. So. Okay, so where were we? So today, finally, we're going to the convergence to the boundary problem. And in general, you know, you, you have, yeah, so the, the, the old setting is the following. We have G, which is SL2R or PSL2R. And then you have mu uh, probability on G. Let's assume that it's countable. And of course, we know that SL2R acts yeah, this uh, SL2R acts by isometries on the hyperbolic plane H2. This is the picture that we already drew several times. And we pick a base point O. And then we look at the random walk. So let's recall the setting. So Wn is G1, Gn, where each Gn, so this the increments of the walk are I, I, D with the distribution here. So that's the basic setting. And what we finally are ready to prove now is that indeed, uh, if the support of the probability distribution on G is not too small, meaning it's not elementary as we already defined in fact last time, and I will recall, then the runner walk indeed will converge almost surely to some, to some boundary point. And this boundary point is, yeah, is some point psi here on the boundary of the disk. And in fact, this theorem, well, has many, many generalizations to uh, more complicated settings. Yeah, including the setting of general possibly non-proper hyperbolic spaces that I actually proved at some point a few years ago, but this is the older result, which is due to first number. So basically recall the following. So we can recall that a probability measure mu on say SL2R is non-elementary If let's call it gamma mu, gamma mu is the group generated by the support of mu. And by the way, here there is sometimes some issue because sometimes people look at the group and sometimes the semi group. In fact, the semi group is more natural for the random walk point of view. But on the other hand, I think in this uh, special case, it's it's easy to to go from group to semi group, so we can just talk about the group. But in general, there is a subtlety here, and often I use the semi group hypothesis, which is a bit stronger, but it avoids a few few technicalities. But okay, let's so this this let's say this group generated is not okay. So first of all, is not contained in a compact. subgroup of G. So that's the first condition. And it does not fix a finite set of, of points in the boundary. 
So again, we already saw last time, which was a while ago. So let, let's remark. <laughs> Remark that basically compact subgroups in this case there are not too many because this is a you know group dimension three two by two matrices with one condition so it's a small co coefficients minus one so three dimensional group and so compact subgroups are one dimensional so these are basically group of rotations. So we don't know uh, what is nice about this proof is I don't think we use specific the structure of this complex subgroups. So it could be generalized to Lie groups in, in, in a higher dimension. So for instance, in SLM. But, and the other one is, okay, and, and the ones that fix, so groups fixing, fixing a finite subset, subset of the boundary of X. Well, this one is what? This is, you remember that this, this finite subset can only have either one element or two elements in this case. So in this case, it's fixing one or two elements. So basically, basically the three cases are like that. For elementary subgroups, you can either fix one point and you rotate on that point, or you fix a point on the boundary and you have a parabolic subgroup that preserves a horrible, or you fix two boundary points and then you're translating along the geodesic from these two boundary points. So these are basically the, the three cases. Yeah, there's also a mixed case between this and this, but yeah, that does not happen in discrete subgroups, but it, okay, it, it could happen in this setting. But basically it's obviously also kind of clear that in each of these three situations, the convergence to the boundary cannot be true at all, because in this case, you're just rotating so definitely you're not going anywhere, basically you're just rotating. In this case, this is like a random walk on R because this is one parameter subgroup. So depending on the, the, the drift, whether you, you, know, you could have drift to the right, drift to the left or no drift. So if you have no drift, then you're like lying on this horrible forever and you're never gonna converge because it's recurrent. And in this case, it's the same thing. So you can have drift in this direction or in that direction, other, and then you would converge, but otherwise you could always have the case where it's balanced, and then you're just doing a random walk on this one dimensional geodesic, so there is really no, uh, this is not gonna converge because it's gonna be recurrent. So these are the various cases. Are there any questions so far? Okay, so this is the recap. So then let me let me state the theorem and then we can prove it. So the theorem due to Furstenberg is the following. So if yeah, so if mu is a non-elementary measure. on SL2R and O is a base point. So is a point in the disk or the body plane. Then, then almost surely this limit exists. The limit as N goes to infinity W and O equals some psi. The boundary of H exists. So what are the contents of this theorem? Again, that almost surely means there's a set of sample paths that has full probability. And 
that the limit exists, not just the length super limit for anything like that, just the limit. And then the limit is on the boundaries, not on the inside. So these are the various things. That can... Okay, so are there more comments? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Because this is elementary. Yeah. Yeah. So these are exactly the excluded cases. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, these are the elementary cases. So in neither of those, you would have this property. Again, here never, here depends on the, on the on the drift of this induced walk and this one as well. Yeah. And if you have SLN, well, the sub cases are more complicated because you have subgroups of you know different uh, dimension. You have you have some least subgroups of different dimensions, and so then you you have to look at those cases. But basically, again, if you want to be fancy, you can say if if this supported mu is Zariski dense then you're in the generic situation and then you have this images. Okay. It's, uh, it's, it's what? It's the risk dense. In SL2R? Yeah, meaning that the group generated by this is not contained in an algebraic subgroup, yeah. right? Because this uh, you know, parabolic subgroup or a hyperbolic or one, one loxodromic subgroup, these are algebraic. They're just, 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 they're nice sub manifolds. Right. Okay. So the proof is, I think, really ingenious because it's kind of indirect. And I, I, yeah, and I really like it. And in fact, this is what we generalized in, in the work with Joseph. So, because the thing is, Another th thing that you also want to note is here there is really no moment condition at all. So this walk is can be really bad in the sense that the jumps can be really unruly. So we don't have any discreteness assumption. So the group generated by the support could be like dense or something like this. This doesn't matter. And you have no moment condition. So the jumps could be enormous. So the only thing that we have is the non-elementary condition. So that's I think is 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 quite um, it's quite a nice nice fact. But the price to pay in some sense is that the, the proof is somewhat non-constructive. So it uses this boundary action. Okay. So yeah. So so there are two two sets of inputs. So on the one hand, from the probability, we will look at we will see that there is convergence in the space of measures. So we look at the probability measures on H union its boundary. So you see. This is a nice compact metric space. So we can look at the action of the group on the space. And there would be an, a stationary measure. And then we can start looking at convergence of this when, you, when you're taking iterates in the way of the stationary measure. We'll, we'll make this precise. And then the geometry, like, yeah, so the, the geometry. Meaning the delta hyperbolicity of of the plane, yeah. So this would tell us that, yeah. So this would tell us that you can relate, yeah. You can relate convergence of measures to convergence of points. And again, these things are quite indirect, but in fact, uh, yeah, I, I find it very odd. So, okay, let's let's start with. Okay, so so first of all, you can, uh, the first claim is that there there exists a stationary measure 
new stationary from this mu. New on yes on H union the boundary of H. Well, this this we, we already saw because this is just by compactness. This is we we saw it. Proof is by compactness, as we already saw, whenever you have a group action on a complex space, there is a stationary mesh of H. Okay. In fact, yes, what we what we want to show. So, yeah, in fact, eventually the measure will be all, all, only on the boundary, will not be concentrated on the inside. So, okay, so we, first of all, we want to show that nu of H is zero. This should be the first. And by the way, recall that one way to construct a stationary measure by by what we already saw is yeah so to do this 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 convolution right to do the Cesaro average of the various various convolutions right so in fact what you can say is that new is the limit and goes well it doesn't have to be but okay that, that's that's a good thing to keep in mind if you if you do Cesaro average of the convolution of the regional measure so you you say you have mu n of g g star yeah let's say Delta of G star O. Is the point of view that we want to say that the, um, the, the measure is supported on the, on the, on the orbit? So it's like a closure of the orbit? Well, the measure definitely will be supported on the, on the closure of the orbit. But of course, the closure of the orbit also has points inside the space, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, you know, you want to avoid that, yeah. yeah. So okay, yeah. I just want to say, right? So here is like, well, what this means is just, you know, you start with the point O, and you look at the end step of the walk, and you you get you get all possible, all possible positions of the walk. You can take. You can start with the delta mass. And by the proof that we did, if you if you are averaging the delta mass, and then you take another average, this Cesaro average, then you're gonna get a stationary measure. In fact, this is not gonna be actually needed from our proof, but this is this is way to to think about what what would the stationary measure would be. Okay, so so okay, so in order to do that, again, we want to look at the space. Of measures. So, so the trick here is to, to apply the martingale convergence. So how do we apply the martingale convergence theorem? Yeah, yeah. So there, yeah, so we need this, we need a bit, yeah, exactly. So this is what we want to show, but we can prove it, yes. Okay, so we, let's apply the martingale convergence. Theory. So to what? <laughs> so we need a martingale. So, okay, we pick, we pick F, a function, which is bounded on C0, like it's a, it's a say continuous even, function on, on well, a, let's say H in, in boundary of H or, yeah, basically the same argument can work either on just the boundary or on both of them. But then, because both of them are compact, even just the boundary itself is compact. But then to, if we want to show this, 
then we have to start with a bigger thing and then say that th this component is zero. Okay, so we define a martingale. How do we define a martingale? We define xn, which is what? We want to define the average of f on the orbit, okay? On the on the on the on the on the walk. So so basically, we just do like this. So they the, the find an integral of f with respect to yeah. We take the n step of the walk. I wish push forward our, our measure. And and yeah, this will integrate on the on the on the on this whole space. So let's call the space um so again, so what are we doing here? So I take in the nth step of the walk, I'm pushing forward the measure that I start with, and I integrate f. So this is a function. Yeah, this is a function on f, for instance. And then, okay, well, it's a function of f and a function of omega, like a, your, your sample path. So omega is an infinite path. So again, you can... Well, also by the by the change of variables, you also know that xn f omega is the integral over m of f w and x d new x. Okay, so now the claim first claim is that for any f, xn, right, f as a function of omega is a martingale. So you're taking the average value of f along this, the, the walk basically. And why is this a martingale? Well, what do we have to show? Remember, we have to show that the expectation of xn plus 1 given x1 xn is xn. Actually, maybe just given xn. So, I will see that it, it only depends on xn. So okay. So so what is this? Well, this is the integral over m of f w n plus one x d new x. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. So basically, if you look at xn, we're looking at the, uh, we know the outcome of the n step, right? So suppose, suppose that wn equals g. So we condition, condition on the n step. Okay, and so so again, so 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 what is this expectation? The expectation of xn plus one given xn. Well, this is the integral over m of f. Again, you see what is wn plus one? So remember that wn plus one is wn times gn plus one. 
So we are conditioning on time n, means that we know already what happens at time n. We know that at time n, we are at g. Okay. So this one, we can just call it g times gn plus one. So this is random, but this is no longer random because you are conditioning. Okay. So, and so wn plus one is g, g n plus one x d nu x. Right? Well, this is x n plus one, but then we still have to average. We have to do one step of averaging because we don't know what n plus one is, right? So, so, so the random part is still still given by this. So we have to average with respect to the possible choice of n plus one, whose distribution is mu. So this is the integral over g, like that. Right, so, so that's literally the, the, this thing. And now what you would like to show is that this is the integral of Wn x, f Wn x d mu. But you see that this is, this is the definition of convolution. Right, so, so right? So recall, right? So that by definition, like if you do the integral of any function phi of, you know, gx d mu g d nu x, The definition of convolution tells you that this is literally by doing the change of variable gx equals y. You see, this is literally the integral over m of pi of y d mu star n over. Definition of convolution because indeed you have g times m into m. You have mu and n, and mu star nu is the push forward. Okay. So given this fact, how can we rewrite rewrite this equation? Anyone? Yeah, exactly. So we can we get the convolution of mu and nu. Right? So you get what? You get the integral over m of f of g y d mu star nu. Of y. And then mu star nu, by fa fact that this is stationary, mu star nu is nu. So this is the integral over m of f of gy d nu of y. So this is the magic. It just sort of shows that this, this notion of stationarity is, is really the right thing. So once you look at this, this thing, this is by definition is xn, right? Because g is wn. We could have left it like wn, but I, I prefer to call it g to show that this is not random anymore because we, we, we conditioned on it. Okay. Okay, so so that's a cute, 
good proof of, of this fact. And then, okay, what else do we know? So we know that now by the Martingale convergence theorem, what do we know about the Martingale? Yeah, exactly. And F is continuous, so it's bounded, the compact space, so it's bounded. That's right. So, so there exists X infinity of F. Right. It's infinity of F omega, of course, such that Xn converges to X infinity, almost surely. So for any f, okay. So now, what do we want to say? We want to say, so the first first claim is that for any for sorry, for almost every omega in this infinite. So at the infinite hat, there exists some measure new sub omega, which is a probability measure in M, such that if you do, if you start with new, you do the push forward on WN star, this converges to new sub omega. So you see. <laughs> This is a convergence in, in, a, in a Banach space of measures. So this is a measure, that's another measure, and this measure depends on the path. Yeah, almost surely there is only. Okay, so how do we go from this smarting gear to the measures? You see there, remember the functional analysis, there is duality between functions and measures, okay? So, so you consider, you consider the following, you see F goes to, so F is a bounded continuous function on M. And this maps to X infinity of F. So for almost every sample path, this is well defined. And so this is, you see, how do we show this is a measure? Yeah, yeah, by in general, yeah, if you look at, you know, Reed's representation theorem tells that if you have a, bounded linear functional on the space of continuous functions, which is positive, then it, it's, a, it's a measure, right? So, so let's call it, I don't know, phi. Phi is, you know, is a map from C zero M into R. Yeah, this depends on omega. Yeah, depends on the depends on the on the specific path. But right, right. So this one is is bounded positive linear functional. Linear in F, right? So if you take F plus G. X, X infinity of F plus G is X infinity of F plus X infinity of G. And positive, okay, if F is positive, X infinity of F is positive. It's obvious because you're taking limits of F, all these integrals are positive. So the upshot is by Ritz representation theorem.
there exists a measure nu, which depends on omega, which is again is a probability measure in M, such that yeah, such that x infinity is indeed the integral of f with respect to a measure. So x infinity of f omega is the integral of f d nu omega over f. Well, every f is e zero. So yeah, so so this is uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I I really like this trick. Uh, maybe you don't because it's not geometric, but it's kind of it shows the power of of, of Martin games. So. So at least abstractly, we know that there is some limiting measure for almost every sample path. If you're pushing forward by the dynamics, right? So this means, right? So again, so this, the way to say it is, you see the limit of the integral of F D new, new and star new converges to the integral of f d nu omega. For any f and almost every omega. So clearly this is exactly the condition to say that the limit then goes infinity of Wn star omega is nu of omega. Is the definition of quick star convergence. If you pair it with every continuous function, you get them. Okay, very nice. So, so now abstractly we have this. We don't know much else. <laughs> this is a bit annoying. <laughs> like that. Also, the other remark, you want to say that by dominated convergence, if you take the integral of these measures, so these measures depend on the sample path. So the average is new. Again, this is an integral with values in in the Banach space measures, so slightly exotic, but not too bad, because again, the space itself is compact, so measures on a compact metric space are nice Banach space. So yeah, so this is just because at every step is true, and then you pass the, pass the limit, the proof is that you want to show that the integral right at every step if you do wn star new and you do the integral of the uh, right the distribution of that dp omega this is new for every n again this is a stationarity property so this is mu this is mu mu n star nu basically. So, so the stationarity is true at every step. And then everything you, you're pairing with the bounded function, there's a little bit of a, one line argument they have to do that to say that if you're pairing with bounded functions, you can take the dominated convergence. You can apply dominated convergence so you can pass the limit inside the integral. So the average of, so these measures, we don't know much about these measures, except that they exist. And on top of that, they, their average is the original measure. Okay. Okay, so now the measure theory part is kind of almost over, basically over. And now we see how, how this mixes with the group theory.
Okay, so now finally, I think we are, we can prove the following. As I said, we can prove that new of the inside is zero. Okay, so first of all, so again, so new, the original new can be written like this is new one restricted to H plus new two restricted to the boundary of H. Uh, sorry, new, uh, let's say, sorry, like that, something like this. Right, these are not probability measures if you, <laughs> if you write it like this, but anyways, the, 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 what I want to say is the, these are these are absolute, this, these are independent of each other because the group acts on H and acts on boundary of H. So if a measure is this is this thing is stationary, then this one is also stationary because the the, the, the two actions really don't don't really interact with each other. The two. They're separate. So, so new restricted to H is also mu stationary. What is the, What do you mean by that restricted to H? Like, is this? Yeah, it's because it's a measure on the whole thing. No, you define it. Mu right. So mu restricted to H of A is new. Of A intersect H. <laughs> just, just that. Yeah. So one of the two measures, so one of the two could be zero. And in fact, the what we want to prove that this part is zero. But so if it's not zero, we can just focus on this one and rescale so that it doesn't match one. So, so so if mu of H is positive, so replace it, replace new by new restricted to h divided by new of h <laughs> okay so we can assume so we can assume the new of h is one just for for simplicity because right? if there is a part we can rescale because both of them would be invariant and would be stage okay and so now now we want to say if that's the case we want to say that if that's the case, then in fact, the group generated by the support has to be contained in a compact subgroup, which we, we don't want. So the claim is, if, if so, if, yeah, if nu of h is, is bigger than zero, then the group generated by the support of mu is contained in k compact subgroup. Okay, so let's see why. So of course, we need to use this proof, <laughs> otherwise we, we wouldn't. Yeah, this part I have to fix in the notes because it's not very well written, but I, 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 will, I will write it, the details about this. Okay, so okay, so so the proof is like this. So okay, suppose that the measure of H is, is one. Okay. So then there exists a ball. Is this a D disk around the zero or radius some R such that let's call this call this D such that the measure of this disk is bigger than one half. So you see there's there's a circle, there's a sum circle like that. This is D. And the measure of this disk is bigger than one half. Okay, now what else do we know? Recall that nu of D is the integral of nu omega of D dp omega. So this integral is bigger than one half. So I want to say that there is a set of positive measure 
of paths of positive measure such that those those is also bigger than one half. Otherwise, if, if it's always less or equal, then you're integrating. So then there exists A in omega of positive measure such that new omega of D is bigger than one half for omega in D, in A. So. So now what's happening, right? So, so now recall that we also know that W and star nu converges to nu omega, almost surely. In particular for omega in A, let's, let's pick this set, because by intersecting this. Okay, so what else do we know? Well, so we know that new star of D. Okay, there is a little mini issue here because the characteristic function of D is not continuous. Okay, but yeah, so you want to say that there exists n0 such that for every n bigger than n0, wn star nu of d, right, is also, it's also bigger than one half because it's convergence to nu omega of d, which is bigger than one half. So I think, yeah, if we don't, yeah, if we, <laughs> Yeah, you have to pair with the function, but okay, if we, if we just say it like this, I think this is literally true. And now, what is this? Well, this by definition is nu of W and inverse of D. Bigger than one half. Now, one of the most remarkable things in probability, you have two sets of measure bigger than one half. What do we know about them? It's a second. <laughs> so what we know is that D intersect W and inverse D is non-zero, it's not empty. Okay. So what does this mean? It means that W N basically maps a compact set inside itself, right? So yeah, you have to pick a little bit bigger compact set, right? But so this means that there exists a compact set, I don't know, the tilde, which is a bit bigger than D, such that WN of the tilde maps, sorry, the tilde. Because you're taking the diameter of D, you, you enlarge it. If this is true for every n bigger than n zero, right? So, in particular, you see, you 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 write what is W n? Well, remember that you see if you take a long n. So let's take, right, so, so okay, <laughs> now the n is what, it's g1, g2, blah, 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 g, no, n minus, n, n minus m, blah, 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 g, n, something like this. And then you could take a larger one, right? So in the end, what do you want to say? That you say you fix a block. So for any any word, any any G or let's call it H in the 
semi-group generated by the support of mu. Yeah, right. So this is an ergodic shift. It's a Bernoulli shift. So almost surely, you're going to see every subword infinitely many times, right? So for any H in the semigroup, the semigroup because the the weights have to be positive for, 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 for yeah. So right. So there are yeah, there are N and M such that H is G N minus M, G N minus M plus one. G N. This is a generic word. So a generic word contains all the subwords by agreement. Okay. In particular, yes. In 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 particular, you can see. So yeah. So H is. Yeah, we can call this H is of the form. W n, uh, so what is it? W n minus m inverse W n, something like this. And both of these things, they preserve this compact set. And so this product also preserves a slightly larger compact set. So exists some d double tilde, which is even a bit bigger, but still compact, such that h of the double tilde contains is preserves in d tilde, the double tilde. <laughs> this is uniform, because we can pick one path, which is good, which has all the good properties that we said, there is many actually, there's a positive measure set of paths that do this. So take one generic path, and if you look at the subwords, after some time, the subwords will, 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 will preserve a compact set. And so since you see every element in the semigroup as a subword of this, then every element in the semigroup preserves compact set. So we're done because then we can then we indeed said what what we wanted to say. So then then support mu in the subgroup is contained in a compact subgroup. Since it's since it, it, it they all preserve this, they all preserve some big ball. So the 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 group that preserves big ball has to be compact. Yes. Yeah. How do you find D tilde? So you know D is like D, W is D, That's right. I, yeah, I think it's just geometry. Something like you know you 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 have a disk, and then okay you're saying that the new disk intersects the previous one, okay. And now, yeah. So now, what do you want to say? You want to say that right yeah you want to say that so the the other thing goes in a larger slightly larger disk just just think something that's like points at the end yeah 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 that that was the that was the the, the, the <laughs> that was the, the geometric argument yeah maybe let me see yeah i don't know maybe maybe this is literally not true though because but you want to say that so you see, because SL2 
so right so yeah so 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 you see h2 is sl2r mod a compact subgroup k which is a group of rotations so so you can always lift yeah so this is a group element so the lift of a of a of a disk downstairs is a compact in a set which is compact in the um in the space you can lift it to a compact subset in the group because because the group the, the, the space is just the quotient of the group by a compact the automorphism? Uh, no, no, no. It's like, no, no, no. It's a, it, no, no, no. That's, that's like that. Because, because if you look at the action, what I want to say is, right? So this SL2R is, yeah, as you said, is, is the automorphisms of H, right? But then the stabilizer of a point is is k right so in that sense you can you can say sl2 r you have a map into h by saying that g maps to g o right and then but if you're in k k fixes o right so you, you, in fact, have a map. Okay, now it depends whether you, I forgot whether the right thing is to do the left the left or the right, but basically, yeah. So maybe if you read it like this, it would be, be like that. So as I said, this is true. Yeah. yeah, so maybe what I want to say is not quite that it preserves the disk, but I want to say that WN, lies in a compact subgroup. Because, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if this is true because yeah. this could get a slightly bigger this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that, that might be the case. So maybe, yeah, I think what, what we want to say is that there exists D tilde in G compact such that WN belongs to D tilde. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, so we are not done because it's uh, still, but we have plenty of time to finish the proof today. So, but let's see, where where are we at this point? Yeah, yeah, okay. And, and now let, let me just finish one thing before we... Before we uh, take a break. So we, we also, also use a remark, which... Because again, here I put subgroup, which again is the more natural from the point of view of random walk. But in fact, you could say um, you could say for group, yeah. And so we have to use the following fact that a compact subgroup, compact sorry, compact semigroup. Yeah, with cancellation is a group. Meaning, for instance, a compact semi group inside a group. Yeah, with cancellation means indeed uh, the cancellation for, for 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 group theory, right? So if if G H equals G H prime, then H equals H prime. And well, so in particular, if if, if, a, if this is inside a group, then you have cancellation because you have cancellation from the ambient group. Yeah, so maybe you've seen this fact for finite the finite semi group of inside a group is a group this exercise 
And if you replace finite with compact, this is still true. So yeah, this allows us to, to, to replace the semigroup with the group. So this would be a compact semigroup, but it's inside the group, so it's still it's still so that that's uh right. So so support mu. So the semigroup generated, we know that this has to be compact by this argument, is also the same as the group. And it has to be inside K. And again, this is very important. The fact that it's compact is important. Otherwise, this is not true and it's it's more annoying. So for this case, it's it's okay. Okay, maybe it's a good time to take a break. So then we can finish the proof in the other part. So we can resume at like 11.15 maybe. Okay, so we can get... And finish the the proof, I think. So let me, yeah, let me just recall. Yeah, maybe let let me just point out one one minor thing about this argument we said before. So so here, if we have d such that d intersect w and inverse d is not empty, well, the compactness comes from from this fact. So if I fix fix O a point in H and I fix R, then I consider G R the set of G such that D O G O is less or equal to R. This, the claim is that this is compact in G. And again, the issue is because there is a map from SL to R into H, which maps G to G O. And then this factors through the you know the stabilizer of O is 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 a compact sub of K. So if you take a compact set here and you pull it back to SL two R, it's also compact. And then once you have that, then that property that the D is intersecting G, you know, W and inverse of D, well, yeah, basically it tells us. The WN belongs to G, and I think at least two, I think the, the computation is three times the diameter of D. So you can do the computation by, uh, you know, triangle inequality. And then from there on, we, we can, and then the other thing you're using is that, yeah, so this is a complex set, so this belongs to here. And then once you have H, yeah, H yeah, it's not quite like that, but what what you're just saying that is that the pro this is a product of compact subsets in the group. So so H belongs to D tilde inverse D tilde. So inverse of a compact subgroup or, or some subset is still compact, so this is compact. So that's sort of completely cleans up the everything. Okay, good. So let's let's now keep going. So let's now see what, what next. So we're not so far on the end. So now we have to use the geometry even a bit more. So in particular the hyperbolicity. Okay, so so the other set, the other observation that we want to say is that okay, so now so now New is is supported. New of the boundary is one. So new we, we proved is supported on the boundary. There is nothing inside. Okay. So what we want to say is the following. Yes. So first of all, we want to say that new is non-atomic. And the trick here, we have to use the other condition about non-elementary where we haven't used yet, which is it does not fix the sign and subset. And the way you do that is you consider 
all the weights, yeah, you consider, so if, if nu is atomic, well, what do we know? We know that there are singletons that have positive measure. In particular, you see, there are, you consider the set A, which is the set of psi in the boundary, such that nu of the singleton is the maximum nu, if the maximum weight of the singleton. So if the max of nu of singletons Right, why, why is it well defined? Because you see, since the total measure is one, for every you know epsilon, there's only finitely many points of mass bigger than epsilon, right? And so this max has to be achieved, cannot be just a supremum. And no, so there will be some set that has the maximum weight, okay? So now you can guess what we want to show. We want to show that the group action wants to fix the set of maximum weights. Right? And the way to do this is you look at the stationary condition. So again, by stationarity, nu is the same as sum of mu and g, g star nu. And okay, so if we if we apply to singleton nu of of xi or yeah or is a sum of a g of mu and g nu of g inverse psi uh because eventually we want to do it for the whole semi groups so it's the same argument actually yeah yeah so each of them right so this is a singleton and so it has to have measure less or equal the original one so this is less or equal than the sum of mu and g nu of xi But then this is a probability measure. So you get nu of xi. It's a classic argument, very, very useful. So now this tells us that indeed we have to have equality here. And so in particular, so here's kind of neat. So what you want to say is you want to say that nu and g so if nu and g is positive could be that the both are zero then you have nothing then nu of g inverse of xi is nu of xi so what do we say so we this means that if 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 xi is in a g inverse of xi is also in a If psi is in A, G inverse of psi is also in A for any G. And so this is for every G in the semigroup, because you see you want mu and G to be positive. So this is true for every, every G in the semigroup. So for every G in the semigroup generated by the support, of you. Okay. But again, right. So in the end, 
you want to say that this the semi group gamma let's call it gamma mu plus which is the se semi group generated by the support well yeah so it means that gamma mu minus plus <laughs> okay inverse if you want right inverse this is the inverse semi group in of a is in a So this fixes, so the inverse semigroup fixes a finite set. Right. So since A is fixed, is finite, again, same proof as before, also the whole group has to fix it. We didn't need mu to the end, so it's still. Yeah, you need mu to the end. Well, okay, you're saying you can do it for the support, Definitely. and then you do it again. Because you just use the dependence product on the support, not on the. Yeah, well, yeah, this is for the semi group, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm saying, yeah, it's kind of the same, right? So if you say that if you start with, if you don't take n, you just say this is true for the support. But then, of course, if a set is invariant for the support, support right. then it's invariant under the semi group. So, yeah. yeah. So, anyways, so anyways, you 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 see that this this inverse semi group fixes a finite set, so the whole group also fixes a finite set. Maybe it's a different one. I don't know. This... <laughs> yeah, I think at some point, yeah, it just anyways, there's a maybe slightly smaller finite set or something. But anyways, it fixes a finite set or a find it and so this contradicts so this yeah this contradicts the fact that mu is non-elementary so again is another thing about non-elementary is that this this stationary non-elementary measures are non-atomic okay so now, now we need geometric lemma. And the geometric lemma is the following. So suppose, suppose you know that a sequence, uh, GN, or like any group elements. So maybe I don't want to call it GN, let's call it HN of uh, of some base point O converges to some boundary point. Okay. So I so then I want to claim the following. If I take the stationary measure and I push it forward by this group sequence of group elements, then this converges to the delta mass at psi. So this is how you use the geometry to relate the fact that you have, a geo if you had geometric convergence, we don't know yet, then you would have uh, convergence in the specific measures, but to a special measure, which is the delta mass. I mean, of course, like it kind of makes sense to think about it. It's like you have at O, you have a bunch of points that go gets closer to here. You want to say that the whole mass, even on the boundary, is pushed, is pushed towards this point. And so this has you have to use some some hyperbolicity. Yeah, maybe not even uh, enormous. Amounts of hyperbolicity, but some, some hyperbolicity. Definitely not true for R two. So, so here's a picture. Okay. So first of all, the 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 fact number one is the following that we already mentioned. Maybe if 
H N O converges to Xi. Then if you pick another point, H N O prime also converges to Xi for O and O prime inside the space. So this we already noticed, I think, at some point, the property of hyperbolic space. So you have a path, I don't know, H2N or something, H2N. Yeah, you have a path that converges to Xi, and then you take another base point, and you act with the same set of group elements. Well, they also converge to the same point. And the reason is that the distance between each steps is constant. So we know that the distance between H and O and H and O prime, since the action is by isometry, is the same as the distance between O and O prime. So this is constant, does not depend on N. And so this is a property of hyperbolic space that if you have two points that have distance, say, one, and again, you move them forward, they still have distance one. And so this, the, the limit of these two sequences is the same in this particular proposition. So limit of H and O is the same as the limit so, so again, so this is the first place where we use some form of hyperbolicity, even though it's kind of weak, but something. Okay, and then what? Then what happens to the boundary? That's the other thing. So we have to show that this is the case. So we take F, which is continuous on the boundary. And you want to do that the integral of f d h n star. So yeah, we can write it like this h n x d new x on the boundary. We want to show that this converges to f of xi. That would be that would be good, right? And the claim is Yeah, the claim is that on the boundary, basically everything converges to Xi, almost everything, except for at most another point. So let's see. Let's see. So suppose, so the claim is for all except one point, one point, so let's call it uh, zeta in the boundary. Well, for all, uh, I don't know, let's call it x at one point. If you do h and x also converges to xi. So if not, then there are there is a subsequence mk and two points let's call it i don't know two not alpha 1 alpha 2 
Yeah. So. So if not, so what happens? It's like, okay, so there's this psi. So we want to show basically everything converges there. But if not, for two, suppose there are two bad points. There is one bad point alpha one and one bad point alpha two. Okay. And we say that alpha one and alpha two up to subsequence, they don't converge to psi. So then there is and a neighborhood u of psi in the union such that, well, such that w and k, sorry, h and k of alpha one is not in the neighborhood, and h and k alpha two is also not in the neighborhood. Right? So we pick a neighborhood u and we assume that you're never inside this neighborhood. So maybe you're here or something. So h and k alpha one, h and k. But now why is this a contradiction? Well, you draw the geodesic between alpha one and alpha two. Again, you need certain level of hyperbolicity to do this. So what do you know? Now you pick a point inside. I pick a point X inside. So we know that X is point inside. So every point inside converges to Xi. So every point in Xa, so if you if you map, if you use this HN, well, at some point you're gonna be very, very close to, to Xa. In fact, well inside you, not just in you, but even much closer inside you. So this would be H and K of X. But then we know that the endpoints are not in you. So maybe let's say that they are here to make it slightly more dramatic otherwise. H and K alpha one. So the geodesic allegedly looks like that. But this is not a geodesic in a hyperbolic. <laughs> so the idea is Yeah, you have like, you know, you have the mother and the father and the kid. The kid wants to go get the ice cream in its side. And the mother and the father cannot. <laughs> At some point, <laughs> this situation <laughs> breaks down. It's not going to work. They cannot hold hands all the time, right? So HN is, of course, an isometry. So you should map geodesic to geodesic. Right. Okay, so. I'm not sure if I can write, but you understand. So since Hn kx goes to xi, so Hn alpha one, alpha two cannot be geodesic. And this is the main, main hyperbolicity picture that we need. And again, this is relatively weak in the sense that we're not using curvature or something like that, but we use some sort of thin triangle, but again, kind of in a weak sense. Okay, of course, once we have this, we can just integrate and we get the this thing, right? Because then, then by dominated convergence, So recall that we had that HN um, for any boundary point 
H and uh, alpha goes to Xi for every alpha, which is not some, some exception that we call it zeta. So we have only one exception. <laughs> so clearly the only thing that we, we have to worry about is that the weight of this zeta is not positive, but it's not. So since, since nu is not atomic, nu of zeta is zero. So the integral of f hn alpha d nu alpha on the boundary Well, this is the same as the integral on the boundary minus zeta. Just that's one point. The binominated convergence, this converges to f, yeah, to the integral of f of psi d nu of alpha. which is f of zeta. Okay, so you see the geometry, I see we haven't proved anything about that yet. Many things that we haven't proved the convergence yet. <laughs> we are going a long <laughs> round, but we're, we're getting close because now we show that if there is a limit point in the boundary, then there is a limit point in the sen in the sense of measures. Yeah. So this again, recall that this means that H n nu would converge to delta at xi. And now we have to just play the tension between this thing. And the, and the martingale convergence theorem that we seen at the beginning. And so, so let's finish the proof. Maybe this is step nine or something like that. Okay. So we recall that for almost every omega, we know that W and star of nu converges to nu of omega. It's some measure, which don't know, but it's some measure on the boundary. Okay? So this is the first thing. The second thing we proved is that, well, first of all, the new of inside is zero. The third one is that for, yeah, that if H n of O converges to Xi for O in H, then H n of star nu converges to the delta mass at the side. Last three, I wonder if the converse of it is correct that you know that H n of nu converges to the delta mass thing, then probably, probably the sequence has to converge to the, to that point. Yeah. Yeah, because you're you're integrating over a neighborhood of psi. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so how do we put these things together? You put it like this. So, okay, so, so now what do you want to show? So first thing we want to show, so you see, you consider a sample path So now a sample path can do various things. 
So first of all, case A can be that the probability that n this this path is bounded. Of course, you want to exclude the fact that this path is bounded with positive probability. Okay, so we want to show that this is zero. Okay, this has to do with the first step that we did by looking at this compact subgroup. Because if if not, if the probability that WN0 is bounded is bigger than some C, well, it means that you see the delta, it means that, right, the probability Right, means that Wn belongs to a certain radius, disk of certain radius with, with some positive probability. So there exists some disk in H such that, how do we write it? We can write a delta right, delta Wn O of D is bigger than some C prime, right? But now we know that the if you if you take a limit of those, you're gonna get a stationary measure, right? But So yeah, so 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 what do we know? We know that you see if we consider new, which is again the limit of one over n sum n equals zero to n minus one. Right. Yeah. Delta of W n zero. Yeah, this is a yeah, the limit, yeah. So if this, you know, if there is a positive probability that you're charging a disk bigger than one one tenth, then the average also is bigger than one tenth. So then the new would be new of disk to be bigger than C prime, which is which I already proved is is not possible. So this is sort of the recurrent case, okay? Now, what about the, the other cases that are more interesting, I think? So there's two other cases. So the other case is that the probability, so there's a possibility that you, you're still unbounded, but also maybe you have a limit point inside. So you want to say the probability the WNO has both a limit point in H and in boundary of H. Principle could be could be the case, right? It could be that you you recur, you recur, and then you go for. I mean, this this is definitely a case. For instance, if you have a geodesic flow on a fast manifold, <laughs> so, you know, it's possible. <laughs> but in this situation, it's it's not possible. And let's see why. So again, so again, so we want to say that. In, in fact, you want to say that you fix some, some D, some R, and you want to say that the probability that W and O has limit point 
in disk of radius r and one in boundary of h is zero. Right? And so the trick here is you look at Radon Nicodem derivative. So basically, if W and K O converges to some Y inside the disk. This implies, yeah, it implies that W and K is bounded in the group. And so this implies that the radon nicotine derivative, W and K star nu over nu, is also bound. Because you see, you're, you're taking this measure on the boundary. If you're just, you know, each element of G acts, you know, it's a C1, C1 diffeo of, of, of the disk. So it only distorts measure by bounded amount. And now if W and K is, con is, is constrained to live in a compact part, well, you can only distort so much. So in this case, the weak limit would be non-atomic, right? Because so if you take W and K nu converges to nu omega, this would be non-atomic. Because of this, because nu is not atomic. And so at each step, your distortion is only bounded. So it's also the limiting measure. But then we saw that on the other hand, if, if it has a limit point in the boundary, then your convergence to delta mass. So of course, these two things are, are conflicting. So if WMKO converges to psi in the boundary, well, we saw that WMK nu must converge to the delta mass xi. So clearly, this is atomic. So again, what is the issue here? The issue here that we know that, that we know by one that by the Martingale convergence theorem, there is a limit which does not depend on the substitutes. This is a key point. So that's why we need this measure theory at the beginning. Because any sequence, particular sequence can do strange things, but a generic sequence has a well-defined limit in the space of orbit. And so if this wandering behavior happens, one limit point will be in atomic measure and an another limit point would be a delta mass. But there's only one limit point because the limit exists. Since by Martingale's convergence theorem, new, uh, yeah, so limit of W nu n exists. Yeah, this is a contradiction. And now you can kind of guess what's the last case, which is very similar, because we just say, okay, what if there are two limits on the boundary? So the third case is the probability that there exists psi one and psi two, two distinct limit points on the boundary. And again, we want to say this is zero. And again, how is that? Well, if W and K of O goes to Psi 1, then 
we saw that W and K nu goes to delta psi one. And if W M K O goes to psi two, then we saw that W M K nu goes to delta psi two. So far so good, but again, by the Martingale convergence theorem, the limit over the whole sequence equals you know exists. So you have to have the delta xi one equals delta xi two, which of course implies the xi one psi two. So yeah. So that fortunately, in the end, even this, even with this uh, detour, we showed that indeed there is a unique limit. So that's it. Again, it, it, it's a, it's a proof which is a bit yeah, it's indirect, but it sort of uses nicely this interplay between points and measures, and so that's why. I think it's very nice, yeah. So, in fact, the one word, if it's not, if, if the space, in the, if the boundary is not compact, then we already end up in, in trouble because there's also another case which we haven't done, considered, which is what if there's no limit point? Yeah. And so, in fact, yeah, when I looked at these examples where the boundary is not compact, then, yeah, you have to do more work. You have to consider another boundary which is always compact. and. So it's uh, there, 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 there. There is more work to be done, but still, this 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 technique, indeed, is 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 powerful, and indeed, it can be generalized. Okay, good. Are there any questions? Okay, good. So if not, then I'll see you Tuesday. Yes. <laughs>